Thessalonians chapter 1. Thank you, Alexa. Um, uh, this, this series is, is, is going to be about heaven and hell, but we're, we're, going, we're going to do hell first. Um, kind of, you know, save the good news for last sort of situation. Hell is not fun to talk about. Heaven will be a lot more fun, I think. Um, but it is something that, that Jesus talks about more than any other biblical writer. It's, an, it's a topic that we must deal with honestly and um, see what the Bible has to say about it because the, it, it's in the Bible and it's in the world and universe for a reason. And we'll look at, at those things. Uh, but just 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. Is that right? Yep. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints, to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. Um, okay, so we're not going to really deal with whether or not hell is um, a biblical reality. I think all of us here probably would grant that it is. You'd have to basically deny the um, inspiration of Scripture to say that hell is not a real place. But we are going to look at um, the different views about hell. Now, here's what's important. In general, and there may be some exceptions to this we'll talk about, but in general, your view of what exactly hell is going to be like does not put you outside of the fold if you think about hell a little bit differently than you think of than, than I think about hell um, within reason. There, this is a topic that we can disagree on. It's one of those topics, very interestingly, and I'm not really sure why, but um, our our the Church of Christ tribe has treated it as you have to hold this one view or you're anathema or you're outside of, uh, of, of the fold, maybe even outside of the faith have treated other views very poorly. And, and, I, and I think by the end of this, you'll, you'll understand why that um, doesn't make a lot of sense to do that. Um, there's, there's three views that have been held historically for the last 2,000 years about, about hell. What I think is going to happen is if, if you're here all the nights, I think um, some of you are going to walk out holding view A. Some of you are going to walk out holding view B. None of you are going to walk out holding view C. That's what I, that's what I predict, is some are going to walk out holding view A, some view B, and nobody view C. And I think that's right. I think the first, uh, I think A and B, which we're going to look at, are both views inside of Christianity, and you can be faithful and hold them. The, the third view is more difficult to say that about. Um, okay, so th the first view we're going to refer to as ECT, but I'll spell it out for you. The first view, also known as the traditional view, is referred to as eternal conscious torment. That is the traditional view, the view that's been held, um, the consensus view for the last 1,500 years, we can say. Early church is more difficult. First three to 400 years, is there's more of a question. But for the last 1,500 years, the, the consensus view has been the view that probably most of you hold about hell. You probably haven't given much thought to it, uh, but it's this idea of eternal conscious torment. Eternal meaning it never ends. Conscious meaning you're aware of it, right? They're always aware. They're not asleep. Um, they're not dead, but always aware. And then torment, of course, just means just means torment. It means pain, means punishment, means all those things. Okay, so that's that's the traditional view, the view of the church for the last 1,500 years. The sort of consensus view is eternal, conscious. That's probably the key word right there for the difference. Eternal, conscious torment. Um, let's look at it. Look at, well... I'll just read it to you. Matthew 25, and, and um, you can check out this later. I'm just doing this for time's sake. Matthew 25, 45, and 46. Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's, if not the key verse, one of the key verses for this viewpoint. The, the, the righteous will go away into eternal life, and the wicked will go away into eternal punishment. Okay, the second view which is referred to by a lot of names, and this one probably isn't the best one, but it's, it's the most common name, is called Annihilationism. Annihilationism is this view. Uh, we'll look at this, but th there's a decent argument that the oldest views we have about hell are annihilationists, or at least that a lot of the early church fathers were annihilationists, which is basically, just to be very simple, is the view that 
you go to hell for a time and essentially and eventually you you are annihilated okay so it's not eternal conscious torment it's not eternal and it's only conscious for a time so you're conscious for a time of punishment and then you cease to exist second peter 2 verse 6 if by turning the cities of sodom and gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction making them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly um i'm i'm I say I'm just getting going. I, there's a lot of hours being spent already. But I'll, I'll tell you this. So I'll, I'll give, kind of give you a head start of where we're going with this. Um, I've always held the kind of basic view without thought, eternal conscious torment view. But throughout my readings and all the things I've been doing, I don't know what I hold right now. So you, you, can, you can rest easy there. But I will tell you that I have found the annihilationist arguments much more compelling than I thought I would. And I have found the eternal conscious torment responses pretty, pretty wanting. Um, and I've tried to listen to the absolute best people on every side and the debates between those people to, to hear the best case of them. And I think you'll find the same, which is why I think, I think some of you will walk out of here thinking, saying, I think annihilation is probably true. I think some of you will say, it's, it's not really convincing to me. I'm, I think the a traditional view is true. Um, I don't think any will hold the universalist view, which is the third option, universalism. And there's a lot of, a lot of branches to this, but the, the basic view of universalist is everyone ends up in heaven. Okay, that's the idea. I, 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 ho I hope that's true. I just don't think it is. Okay, I mean, it'd be great if it was, I, but I, I don't think you can hold that view biblically, which we'll look at. Um, but the idea is that there is a hell, but the purpose of hell is a refining fire to refine those who are sinners until they are sanctified enough to be saved, whatever that, whatever that means. It's explained various ways. Um, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's the basic argument that we'll see. And we won't spend a lot of time on this one. But the basic universalist argument is if Christ is going to reconcile all things, the only way that happens is if everyone ends up in heaven. Otherwise, everything is not reconciled. There is an argument that's made. Scholars make it. Um, but I, I don't think that it's convincing. Here's what's fun about these kind of series. Um, we, I started the Biblical Manhood and Womanhood series, however long ago that was, with one view, and I, and I finished it with the same view, but pretty significantly affected and tweaked. Um, in the same way, started the divorce series with one view and left with a different view than I started with. So this is fun, right? We're starting a series together, and we'll see what happens when we come out of it. We're gonna look at uh, the Bible, just try to be honest with what the Bible has to say uh, without preconceived notions, and... Um, Probably a lot of, probably half of us come away with different conclusions than the other half, which is, which is fun. Because this isn't one of those issues that you have to believe a certain thing in order to be a Christian. Some churches uh, would say that you cannot be an annihilationist to be part of that church. But of course, we come back to the Church of Christ thing where that's not an issue that we have. Okay. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at the main words that are used for the afterlife in the Bible. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament. The New Testament has a couple words we're going to look at. And then we'll finish by asking, what happens to us when we die? Like the moment we die, what happens? And then we'll get into the views more next week. Okay, great. Any, any questions so far? Anything before I really get going? Okay, the Old Testament, we don't get, we don't get much, okay? Um, certainly per capita. The Old Testament gives us much less about the afterlife than the New Testament does. And there's no didactic teaching. There, there's no section in the Old Testament where it says, this is uh, heaven, this is hell, or this is what it's going to be like. We just kind of have passing, we, we get an idea of what the Jews believed about the afterlife. And the word that's used throughout the Old Testament, by far the word that's used most often, 65 times, is the word Sheol. Sheol. Now, for a long time, um, New Testament uh, translators would translate it as grave primarily, or pit now, the, the most newer versions, NIV still does that, which is fine. Most newer versions, like if you have ESV, uh, I think, well, I know the ESV doesn't. Well, just, you, just gives you the word Sheol, because it's not exactly a parallel to anything we have in English, so it gives you the, the Hebrew word and, and just says the word Sheol. So this is, this is that word. Um, and then we'll talk about the New Testament version in a minute. But we do have with the afterlife what's called... Um, progressive revelation, meaning that we know a lot more in the New Testament than they knew in the Old Testament, um, and we see that in the texts. All right, I'm going to uh, read some of these passages to you, um, and maybe we'll look up a couple. Genesis 37, we're not going to look at 65 passages, I'm just going to give you a few. 
Genesis 37, 35, about Jacob. It says, all his sons and daughters rose up to comfort him when Joseph died. But he refused to be comforted and said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Okay, so Joseph dies. Jacob's upset and they're trying to give him comfort. And he says, no, I will go down to Sheol to my son. Not literally, but him saying, I'm, I'm downtrodden and I would rather go down uh, to my son. By the way, if, if, you're, if you're wanting all these passages, uh, this, is all, this is all online already. You can just Google, like, you can Google Renee Zerang Hell, and this will come up, and this whole thing is there. So don't stress if I'm moving too quickly. Job 7, verse 9. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. Okay, he who goes down. So I want you to think about these things, how this word's being used. Lamentations 3, 6. He has made me dwell in darkness, that's Sheol, like the dead of long ago. Job 17, 16. Will it go down to the bars of Sheol? Shall we descend together into the dust? <clears throat> We're going to look at a few more, but the, the best way by far to understand this word is, is that English idea of the grave. That's, that seems to be the Old Testament idea. Okay? Um, it's also understood, it's understood often as sort of the realm of the dead. And it's not, just, it's not just the wicked in the Old Testament, right? We have Jacob saying, I'm going to go down to Sheol. Job talks about it. It seems that they believe that everyone is going to Sheol in some sense. And so it's described often as the realm of the dead. But I think at least in 95% of the verses you read in the Old Testament, when you come to the word Sheol, the best understanding is grave, to death, to the grave. And this sort of poetic language about going to, um, to death. Um, for my soul, Psalm 88, 3 and 4. My soul is full of troubles. My life draws near to Sheol. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Psalm 139, 8. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, my, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Isaiah 38, 18. For Sheol does not thank you. Death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not hope for your faithfulness. Um, Job 17, 13. If I hope for Sheol as my house, if I make my bed in darkness. One more. Psalm 89, 48. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Um, okay, so in the Old Testament, Sheol is, is something that is expected of all believers, basically, or all people, believers or wicked, haste free heart. Let me hold you. Okay, that's the common answer. That was what it was expected. Um, okay, so Sheol is kind, of this, it's kind of a realm of the dead idea, but I think much more accurately, it's just like saying going to the grave, going to death. Going to be to, and it's always they always talk about going down, which is interesting. Going down into Sheol, uh, which probably is is this that kind of poetic language of going down into the grave, going um, down into death. But there there does seem to be some kind of idea that Sheol was in the earth or it was below, um, which is interesting. Um, it, it does seem like in the Old Testament some kind of resurrection was expected. Okay, so. They, they, it does seem like they expected, for, the Christians or believers expected that they would not stay in Sheol forever. Uh, there's that famous passage in Psalm um, 16, which Jesus, or it's quoted about Jesus, where it says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your holy ones see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. Which is, of course, about Jesus, but it's also about the person who's writing it. And you, you never have someone writing something that's not at least true about them in some sense. So it's also true of the, that the believer who wrote uh, Psalm 16 believed that he wasn't going to stay in Sheol forever. Uh, uh, 1 Samuel 2, 6, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up from Sheol. Maybe the most beautiful, Job 14, 14 and 15, Job says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service I should wait till my renewal should come you would call and I would answer you that you would long for the work of your hands. Job says, if I was to die, I know that God would bring me back because he longs for his creation, that he has made me, that I am his, and he will not leave me to Sheol. So it's less explicit, but there is an Old Testament idea, it seems, that the, that the Jews understood that they wouldn't stay in Sheol, that there would be some sort of resurrection, though they had very little understanding of what that was going to be like. Okay, so the Old Testament word for afterlife is Sheol. That's the word we see throughout the Old Testament. Best understanding of that is the grave, the pit, death, the place everyone goes, regardless of faithfulness. Okay, the New Testament word, which is at least as close to parallel as we can get, is the word Hades. The word Hades. 
um, which means basically the same thing. It means grave, means realm with the dead. Um, look at, turn to Revelation 20, and you can leave your Bibles here for a minute. Revelation chapter 20. This is a key passage in our discussion. Revelation chapter 20. It's going to be verses 13 and 14. It says, And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Okay, so here, what I want you to see there is there's a distinction made between Hades and the lake of fire. Those aren't the same, right? Because Hades is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So there's a, there's a difference there. Um, Matthew eleven twenty three. 23. You, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works have been done in you were done in Sodom, it would remain until this day. Matthew 16, 18, a verse you know well, a verse we talked about a lot in our church history series. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of, it's actually Hades is the word, the gates of Hades will not prevail against my church. One of the difficulties in, in the English language is this idea of hell, because in the New Testament, there's mainly two words that are translated hell. One is this word Hades, which doesn't really mean hell. And the other one is a word, the third word we'll look at today, which is probably the most important for our series. Um, but like the gates of, we, we normally say the gates of hell will not prevail against it, but it's actually the gates of Hades. And the idea there is probably more like the gates of death, the gates of the grave, um, Will not prevail against will not prevail against us. Though there, though there is uh, potentially some kind of hell connotation there as well. Uh, Acts two twenty seven. You will not abandon my soul to Hades. Quoting that Psalm uses the word Hades instead of Sheol. Um, Revelation one eighteen. The living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Jesus saying, I have the keys of death and of Hades, etc. The, one of the more confusing passages in this regard, we'll turn there. Look at Luke 16. This is, uh, at least as far as I can tell, the only one that, where it seems like Hades is, is more like hell than just like Sheol. But there's some interesting things. Luke, Luke 16, you know this parable probably, well, parable or not, about the rich man and Lazarus. We won't read the whole thing, but... There's a parable or there's a story Jesus tells about a rich man who had all his comfort on earth while Lazarus would beg him and the man would never give him what he begged. And so in the end, Lazarus ended up in Abraham's bosom, which, which, is, a, which is heaven-like. And the rich man ends up in Hades, which is hell-like. And he is being in torment, longing to be um, given some relief. And so we have, we have the word Hades used there. Um, about this man being in torment. But we'll, we'll, we'll look at this parable a, a fair amount more as we get into the series. Okay, so in general, Hades, we understand the same way as we understand Sheol. In the, in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, whenever the word Sheol comes up, they use the word Hades. And so the early Christians saw those two words basically as interchangeable. So those are, those are the two words we have the most in the Bible about the afterlife. Sheol and Hades, meaning primarily the grave, the, uh, the, the, the place of the dead, the realm of the dead, etc. All right. Um, so we don't, we don't get a whole lot about heaven and hell from those ideas, but it's important that we look at those. Okay. Anything on that before I introduce you to the most important word that we're looking at? On Sheol or Hades. Purgatory. Yeah, so the, the, the less Catholic word would be intermediary state or intermediate state. Um, and, well, I'll get there in a second. Uh, yeah, okay, third word. The other word in the New Testament translated hell is Gehenna. Gehenna is the word translated hell. For instance, Matthew 18, 8 and 9. If your hand or foot cause you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than when two hands or two feet be thrown into the eternal fire. 
<clears throat> and if your eye calls you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire or the Gehenna of fire. Uh, so the word in Revelation, which we just looked at in Revelation 20, it says lake of fire. The word Gehenna isn't there. But the, but the Jews in the first century and the Christians in the first century seem to have understood Gehenna and lake of fire as the same thing. Right? So we have Hades being thrown into Gehenna of fire, hell of fire, eternal fire. There in Matthew 18, those ideas are interchangeable. Jesus uses that Gehenna word. Okay, now you may have heard this said, and I say this because I've said it, that Gehenna was... Uh, a trash dump basically in the first century where people put their trash and their dead bodies and it was always burning. And Jesus was saying, it's like that trash dump. That's what hell's going to be like. And um, that's possible. But the first source we have that says that is a thousand years after Jesus. We don't have anything before that that says anything about a garbage dump or a trash heap. We have a guy saying that after the year a thousand. Um, so it's possible, but it, it's not likely that it was actually a trash dump. What's, what's actually, what we know for sure is that, that Gehenna, that word, that all this word means is of, of Hinnom. And it is referencing a, a, a place that was very common to that first century Jew called the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom. Now let's, let's jump to the Old Testament. Look at 2 Kings chapter 23. And look at a couple real quickly. 2 Kings 23, to, to figure out what this valley of Hinnom is. So Jesus says, Jesus calls hell the valley of Hinnom. That's, that's what he says. He's saying that this eternal fire, hell fire, is valley of Hinnom fire. That's what Gehenna is. Gehenna of Hinnom. Referencing that valley. 23 verse 10. 2 Kings 23, 10. And he defiled Topheth which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no one might burn his son or his daughter as an offering to Molech. Okay, so we have valley of Hinnom is a location that people are offering their children to Molech. Remember Molech being um, one of the gods that people were offering child sacrifices for commonly in the Old Testament. So they're doing that at the valley of Hinnom. All right, look at uh, Second Chronicles. So you're in Second Kings, go to the right. There's a couple of books. Second Chronicles 28. Verse 3. Second Chronicles 28, 3. And he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his sons as an offering, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings in the high places and on the hills and on every green tree. Okay, so same idea. Child sacrifice at the valley of Hinnom. One more in the key one. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7. I'll keep going to the right. Past Psalm and Proverbs and Isaiah. Jeremiah chapter 7. Starting in 31. 30. Anyone, uh, anyone have a heading above verse 30? Valley of slaughter, that's what I got to. Okay, for the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house that's called by my name to defile it. And they have built the high places of Topheth, there's that name again, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will, it will no more be called Topheth, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Topheth because there is no room elsewhere. And the dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth. And none will frighten them away. And I will silence in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall become a waste. That is the, that's the key, key phrase that Jesus would have been referencing when he calls it the Valley of Hinnom, is this idea of this valley of of slaughter, this valley of waste, this valley of people of, of utter evil, right? the, the, the epitome of evil being child sacrifice. This is the place that happens and it's going to become, because of that, the valley of slaughter, the valley of slaughter, where there's nothing, everything will be wiped out. It'll be nothing but a wasteland. The land shall become a waste. It shall be a wasteland is the idea there. And so when Jesus says Gehenna, he is saying the valley of slaughter. 
That, that's what he's talking about with hell, this idea of these things. Um, and then, well, you don't have to turn there, but Jeremiah 19.6 again says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place shall no more be, no more be called the, son of, the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And we see, this, we see this, this imagery picked up by other people besides Jesus in the first century. They use valley of slaughter to talk about the ultimate judgment of God. Um, this Gehenna of fire, which Jesus says in Matthew 5. Uh, Matthew 10, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna and Hinnom. Matthew 23, you serpents, brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to Gehenna? Okay, so we have Revelation 20, where death and Hades is thrown into the lake of fire, thrown into the valley of slaughter, etc. Okay, now we've laid significant groundwork for our discussion. We have Hades and Sheol being Old Testament words. That probably won't come up again in the series, but it's important that you understand those things. And then Gehenna being... Uh, this, this primary word for fiery hell that we think of in the New Testament, this valley of Hinnom. Okay, any thoughts on that before the last thing for today? Yes, Lou. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're right. It's my fault. Yep. Right. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's good. Um, probably in general, just to give you a basic answer, him having the key to death is him being the conqueror of death, right? The key to the lock that we never could free ourselves from, um, being death and then eternal death uh, by extension. And Christ is the one who opens that, that uh, lock. Um, but we'll look at that more in depth in the future. Uh, anything else on that? Okay, let me answer quickly. What happens when we die? Maybe the most interesting question today. What happens when we die? Um, let's look at a few verses. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 52. Okay, so let's talk about first what we know is going to happen in the future. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. Uh, I should go back to 51. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will raised or be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Okay, now what is being raised? Um, what, is being, what is being raised? It's, the, it's, the, it's our bodies being raised. That seems natural, right? So it's not, that our, it's not that our souls are being raised, but our bodies are being raised from the dead, being raised and being made imperishable, and we shall be changed, okay? Um, look at, well, we're going to come back to 1 Corinthians 15, but listen to Philippians 3, verse 20. It says, Our citizenship's in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Okay, we know that's coming. That our bodies, which will go in the grave, will be, tra- will be resurrected and transformed to be like Christ's. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Okay, so just like Christ, the first fruits of the resurrection, the first of the resurrection, we will follow Christ in his resurrection. Our bodies too will be risen from the grave and we will meet with um, Christ. Okay, so we, all, we know that's happening. That is clear Christian teaching. There will be a resurrection in the future of our physical bodies. They will be glorified and will become like Christ's body forevermore. But what about now? Right? What about I die now? I die on my way home today. What happens to me in that moment? Do I go to sleep? 
something we'll call soul sleep, and I just kind of wake up at the second judgment? Is there this, this um, intermediary period where it's in between? Uh, what, is the, what happens to me when I die now? Okay, let me give you a couple of things um, that we know. And there's not a ton biblically, but here's what we know. Jesus with the thief on the cross, maybe that comes to mind. He says what? Today you will be with me in paradise. Very interesting word. doesn't use the word heaven or New Jerusalem, but he uses this word paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today. Another phrase we know of, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. Where is that at? Anyone know? It's actually not in the Bible, but, but it, is, it is a biblical teaching. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. You're in 1 Corinthians. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. That statement is basically a summary of what's here in 2 Corinthians 5, and it's not incorrect. Um, verse 6. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home, at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, said, look back at verse 1 right here, 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says, For we know that if the tent, that's he's talking about our earthly bodies, that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. This is interesting language, right? Paul is saying that we groan in our earthly bodies, longing, longing, for our heavenly dwelling. Verse 4. For while we're still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, that is, not that we'd be without a body, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Um, so Paul talks about that our longing in this body is not to be disembodied, so that we're just spirits, but to be further bodied, like to receive a body like Jesus' body, to receive the life body and not the body of death, um, which I think is beautiful. Okay, so um, to be absent with the body, to present with the Lord, it's a biblical truth. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. That is true. Uh, we have Philippians chapter 1, verse 19 and following. Paul says, uh, if I know that the through your prayers, the help of the Spirit of Christ is to turn out for my deliverance. He goes on to say, <clears throat> uh, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to die and be with Jesus, for that's far better. Okay? My desire is to die and be with Jesus, for that's far better. And then we have, um, we have the Luke 16 parable of Lazarus and the rich man where this man has died, and Jesus hasn't returned yet, but the Lazarus is already in Abraham's bosom. It's in this paradisical place. Okay, so this is, this is one of those categories in the Bible where I think a lot of times we pretend like the Bible gives us a lot more than it does, but here's, here's the way that Christians have understood this down through the ages, is that Abraham's bosom that Lazarus is in, and paradise that Jesus talks about is the same place and it's the place you go immediately upon death. That at, at death, the angels carry you to Abraham's bosom, to, uh, to God himself. But it's not the new heavens and new earth. It's not the new Jerusalem that, God, that Christ is preparing. There is a difference. That God is there. And that to, to, it, Paul says to be there would be far better. Okay, So it's still heaven in the way we think of heaven being God is there, that Jesus is there. But it's not the new heavens and new earth that we are going to. Okay? That's the way tr Christians have understood this traditionally. And the same thing is conversely true about hell. That there is the same sort of place that the rich man is in, in Luke 16, that is not Lake of Fire Gehenna, but is still um, hell-like. 